We are in a sermon series uh, from the book of Isaiah, the heart of God through Isaiah, it seems all the way through the book, is calling God's people to return. It's a winsome call. Being a parent and a grandparent, I can't possibly imagine, I've not had to go through this, but I can't possibly imagine the heart of a dad watching his kids walk away from him and the family. I know my love for my family doesn't exceed yours for your family, but if you can just identify with me for a moment, if you can imagine, if you're not a dad or a mom, if, if you can just imagine what that heart would be to see your kids walk away from you and walk away from the Lord, the, the, uh, the anguish of it strikes me as almost unbearable. And yet the heart of the Father through the book of Isaiah is just a constant call back. The first sermon I did, it was the call of God just back to him. And I feel that this is God's heart for America right now, that God would call the nation back to him from the place of apostasy to which we have sunk and are paying the price for it. Second sermon I preached last Sunday with a couple of other Sundays in between was the heart of God calling his people back to trust and back to faith. Today, the theme of the message, which is not an accident, and, and Catherine, as she planned today's worship songs, didn't know what I was preaching on, but it's not an accident that I'm preaching on the heart of God through Isaiah with God calling his people back to worship. And it's a critical call because we got to understand it's what you were designed for. Genesis 1.27 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, 1.1 said. And then well, by the time you get to 27, when all of creation has been completed, the pinnacle the pace de resistance of God's creative power and genius is when he created humanity. And the Bible says he created us in his likeness and image. And it was so important to him that he said it twice, phrasing it a different way, that in his likeness and image we were created. Why was that? It was so that we could handle proximity, understand proximity to God, and embrace intimacy and proximity with God. We were made in his likeness and image so we could identify his presence. I don't know if you're a guest and you're not used to a service like this. Uh, all of our services aren't like this, but as you know, the order of services kind of went out of the window when it was obvious that the Holy Spirit was working in our hearts and lives. And the most important thing, when he makes God's presence so powerfully known in a service like he did today, is for us all to just kind of go on pause. And again, that's why I thank the worship team, because they all know that when God starts to move, the most important thing is, God, what... God, what are you doing right now? We all have such a short span on this earth that we dare not waste a moment of God's presence and arrival in our company, in our midst, privately, in our homes or in our services, but what we say, God, what are you, what are you doing here? Uh, what do you want to have happen here? God forbid that any of us in any service setting or in private as you experience God's presence that we would just sort of casually stroll our way through like it's another trip to the zoo somehow to look at the specimens, but rather that we would say, God, you, you're here. You're so obvious here. What do you want to do in me? And the reason that that's important is because you were designed by God to be able to experience his presence and know his nearness and be able to respond to his voice. That's how you were created, to worship. 
I know some of you don't think you're worshipers because maybe you were raised in a certain European culture or where stoicism was valued and you've been so accustomed to having a stiff upper lip. Maybe it's the way you were raised. I'm not saying you've got to cry like sometimes I do or you gotta, your reaction's got to be like me, but I am saying you were created in the image and likeness of God so that as he shows up in your life and you sense the proximity of his presence, presence, you would have capacity to respond whatever that looks like. It may not look like my response. It may not look like someone else's response. And that's, that's not important. One of the dangers we have in the Pentecostal movement is trying to have conformity to our responses. And it's not about a conformity to a certain Pentecostal response to the presence of God. It's about what is he doing in you? What does his touch mean to you? I'm going to need some Kleenex talking about people that cry, but just bring me the whole box. (laughs) Thank you. Could you turn the mic off for a second, please? (laughs) And so I've been looking at this subject all week about God's calling his people back to worship. What does that mean? I think sometimes we have a very narrow view of worship. We think of worship as the songs we sing on a Sunday service. And you're either musical or you're not. You're either into music or not. You're either touched by music or you're not. And we value and we weigh all that as worship. But I want to just walk you through the lives of a few people in the New Testament first who suddenly had Jesus show up. I want to start with Matthew, the tax collector. And if you just imagine with me, put yourself in his shoes. You're a tax collector, and as most tax collectors, the reason they were so hated in those days is because they didn't just collect the taxes that Caesar was looking for. They collected more and under duress. So as a result, they took people's money from them that they had no business taking, and they were just generally hated. So you're hated, you're in Capernaum, this is your town you're a tax collector in, and people hate you, so you walk around with your head down low and you expect the hatred, but you love the lavish lifestyle that the taxes, (coughs) excuse me, and your crookedness provide for you, so you keep doing what you're doing. And suddenly, in the middle of a tax collecting day, (laughs) (coughs) excuse me, you suddenly become aware of a presence. And obviously, we'll find out from Matthew someday what that felt like, right? But you're busy collecting taxes, and suddenly there is a presence. And when you look up, it's Jesus. And he just says something very simple to you. says two words, follow me. And I would submit to you this morning that without that intimacy with God and the proximity to God's presence, Matthew would still be a tax collector there in Capernaum today. But because Jesus was near and he sensed something, he sensed something moving in his heart. He had no choice but to leave all the stuff behind. I believe he probably even left money behind. Why? Because he didn't care. The master, just like he did for us in worship this morning, stepped into his life. And I'd suggest to you that Matthew's following Jesus is worship. We think of singing, and I, I agree, singing moves me, but, but I want you to know that Jesus showed up in Matthew's life, and when Matthew opened the door to his tax booth, left everything behind, and started following Jesus, that was an act of worship. Let me take you to another scene. A, a Pharisee is throwing Jesus a party. Most think a dinner party. Most think it's in Capernaum also. And all the dignitaries show up, all the people with BDs and MADs and and, uh, DBs, whatever, all the degrees behind them. These were degreed religious people. 
And Simon called them together. And actually, when you read some of the gospels on this account, they actually intentionally or unintentionally slighted Jesus, but they invited him as a guest and then treated him as no guest at all because they didn't wash his feet, they didn't acknowledge him, and they gave him a place probably at the end of the table. And in those days when you went to a dinner party in Jesus' day, you didn't sit in the chair sit facing the table, you sat sideways on a cushion where the table was a low table and your feet were behind you. And nobody noticed to begin with that an immoral woman stepped into the room. We're not told how she got there. She'd heard about the dinner party, I guess, but something. Jesus had been in proximity with this woman. I am guarantee it. Sometime before the story unfolds in, Mar in Luke's gospel in chapter 7, there'd been some connection between Jesus and this woman that had touched her deeply. And she wasn't quite sure what it was, but she knew when she heard she was, he was at Simon's house, she just knew, I've got to get into that house and I'm going to bring with me the most expensive thing I own. I'm going to bring some of this ointment with him. And if I can just get close to him, I'm going to worship him. And the story goes in Luke 7 that she comes in behind. And even though all of the guys around that table probably recognized her from the evenings she had spent in their houses. And yet in their self-righteous snobbery, they actually accused Jesus of, of not understanding or discerning how wicked this woman was. What they didn't know was that a moral, wicked woman had had Jesus touch her heart. And she comes into that room behind his feet, not wanting to, anybody to necessarily see or recognize her. And the, and the Luke records that she wet his feet with her tears and then took her hair and began to wipe his feet with her hair. And then she took this most precious ointment and poured it out on his feet. I want to suggest to you that that act in itself, while not necessarily a song in a congregation like we've just worshiped today, was a singular extravagant act of worship as she lavished praise on the one who had, even though we don't know when the altar call happened and we don't know when she actually or how she responded, we know by that act that she'd come with one thing in mind. She was determined she was going to worship Jesus. Why? Because he had touched and changed her heart. The immoral woman was an immoral woman no longer. It's worship. It's worship. It's worship. And then let me go to another story with you of Jesus going to Bethany just a few miles east of Jerusalem, and he slips into the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And in Luke's account in chapter 10, Mary hears that Jesus has come close. He's in her house. And of course, Martha's getting dinner ready because they got dinner guests. And Jesus is one of those guests. And you know the story. I don't need to go through the details. But Mary suddenly realizes right now there's nothing more important than proximity to Jesus. Listen, the American church has got to be very, very careful. While I, while I express my gratitude to this worship team and rhythm section, and I know their hearts that they're not like this. But the American church has become so accustomed to being entertained and to sitting back in a congregation like this and simply determining, determining whether that song meets their criteria or whether the worship team is doing what they're supposed to. We're so used to being entertained that, that unlike Mary, who determined, I don't care about dinner. I don't care if dinner's late. I don't care if the beans get burned in the pot. I'm staying here to to listen to the voice of my Savior. And I believe the revival that's coming, it's going to be a revival of worship. One of the things that'll be revival of worship. And we won't be able to stop a service like we just had because the presence of God will come down. The presence of God will come down. Thank you. The presence of God will come down and you won't 
You won't be able to do anything else. And I'm not saying this because I'm looking necessarily to manipulate this happening, but one o'clock will come and you won't care. And two o'clock will come on Sundays and you don't care and let the beans burn in the pot before you get home. You don't care because why? We're in the presence of God. We're in the presence of it. And even though Martha may, may reprimand you, you still don't care. Because you want to hear, hear Jesus saying, You've chosen the better part. I want to take you to another story just quickly, just quickly. I want to talk to you. I want to help you understand that worship is proximity to Jesus. And that proximity to Jesus demands a response. <laughs> we had a deacon. We had a deacon in the church in Cedar Rapids, George Kramer. I was able to do his memorial service last fall. He's gone to be with the Lord. And George was a, a bridge builder, a tough. He and his family business built bridges in a three-state area. And I went on the job site of some of those bridges. Incredible thing to watch him stop the river to put the pylons down. It's just an amazing. But you can imagine George was tough. He had to run uh, uh, the cruise. He's just a tough bridge builder. And you never knew when the Holy Spirit was touching George except one thing. You'd be in worship and you'd be watching George wondering if he's worshiping at all. The priest and George would go. <laughs> the minute George rocked up on the balls of his feet, you know, oh, 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 Holy Spirit's all over George. <laughs> George is in the middle of revival. And then you find out later all the things God said to him. And so it's not, a, I'm not saying it's about expressiveness. In Mary's case, it is a, worship is about a determined purpose to get near to his feet so you can listen to his voice. So let's go to Peter quickly in Luke chapter 5. Peter and the boys have been fishing all night. They caught nothing. And if you watch The Chosen, which if you haven't, you should. And he comes in from the shore, from the, from the lake and, and he caught nothing. And Jesus is teaching some people on the, on the shore and turns and for the first time engages Peter. And uh, he, in the process of the conversation, he discovers that Peter's been fishing all night and and caught nothing. And so Jesus says, Peter, now remember, G Jesus has come close. That's the point this morning. Worship is the proximity to Jesus. I, I, help me remember to come back to the story. I watched some clown on Twitter, some preacher clown on Twitter. And I say that with all the kindness of my heart. <laughs> who, who didn't imply, he actually said, that there are too many people looking for an experience with Jesus, that the word of God is all we need. We don't need an experience with Jesus. And I thought, oh my goodness, it's the word of God that leads us into the encounter with Jesus. So Peter is close to Jesus in the boat and Jesus says, hey, push the boat back out and throw the net on the other side. You catch some fish. And, and you know, Peter is a professional fisherman, so it's, it's understandable. He said, Lord, we've been, we've been fishing all night and we've caught nothing. But then in the King James, it says, nevertheless, but in the new NLT, he says, but if you say so, I will let the nets down again. And I would suggest to you that obeying Jesus' say-so is itself an act of worship. That when he says so, we move immediately in obedience. And that's worship. And then when you go to the end of that story, it's amazing. The, you know, the boat's full. It's about to tip over. They have to call the sons of Zebedee over. Their boat gets full. And when, when Peter finally comes to shore, I love this because I feel it in my own heart. When Peter comes to shore, he stumbles up on the shore and falls at Jesus' feet. And he said, oh, Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. And I'd suggest to you right there that repentance is worship. We've forgotten repentance today. Our way of dealing with sin we get caught in is damage control. Our nation has developed a 
a, an industry of damage control instead of repentance. And I would suggest to you and me that when the Holy Spirit catches us in some manner violating God's word or his holiness, that the best act of worship we can have right in that moment is what Peter did when he fell on the shore at Jesus' feet and said, please, please just leave me. I'm, I'm such a sinful man. The good news is Jesus didn't leave him, and he became one of Jesus' right-hand disciples. Why? Because when Jesus was near and worship was an option, Peter chose repentance. God send a baptism of worshiping repentance in the church of Jesus in America. I'm not going to go on with, I got tons of other examples, and you probably are sitting there thinking of some of them yourself. Zacchaeus is an example, right? Tons of examples of when Jesus comes near, our response is worship. In fact, I want to give you the Tyndale Bible Dictionary definition of worship. If you've got a pencil ready, we may be able to find the slide for you, but here it is. Worship is the odd response to the saving acts and praiseworthy character of God. And I would suggest, not that I'm a scholar, but the only thing Tyndale has missed, bless his heart, in this definition is proximity to Jesus. Because it's not just his character. Yes, I love his character. And his word reveals his character. And it's not just his praiseworthy acts. It's his presence. You're designed for his presence. That's worship. Odd response. And it's what happened this morning when the whole service kind of stopped. First of all, it's a response. There's nothing worse, I think, than Jesus coming near and having no response. In fact, can I say something to you? If you're in, a serv if you're in services like we just had and, and there's no response, I've been like that sometimes. Don't feel bad. I've been like that sometimes. But when there's no response in you at all, it's time for you to go home and get on your face before the Lord and get the word open and say, God, there's something wrong in me. Charles Finney, the great 19th century revivalist said that when he would go for a season not experiencing God's palpable presence, he would stop his ministry, stop his preaching, stop the meetings, and he'd get out into the woods on his face before God until the touch of God came back on his life. It's a response. Secondly, it's an odd response. Awe meaning wonder. And you see where Israel got into trouble in idolatry during the life of Isaiah is because when Israel came into the promised land and they were, instead of living around, and I think even though I know this was God's plan, I think there's a lesson in here for us. When they were in the wilderness, they were all camped around the tabernacle. And the Bible says the opening of their tents all faced in towards the tabernacle. So when the glory of the Lord came down, they were able to, to experience the glory of the Lord and enter in. And so proximity to God was not a problem in the, in, the, in the Exodus all the way through to when they get in the promised land. Then think about this for a moment. When they get in the promised land, now for the first time in over 40 years, they are scattered, 12 tribes, 12 allotments. And yes, God is still present in the tabernacle, but the tabernacle now is in a single location called Shiloh. And for 325 years if you, that they were in during the judges, if you wanted to be close to God, you had to go to Shiloh. So there's no immediate sense of God's presence as they're spread all over the promised land. And they're spread in amongst all the Canaanites who worshiped idols. And those idols looked attractive to them. Because instead of having to go to Shiloh, there was an idol in every front yard. There was an idol in every street corner. So you didn't have to go to the trouble of going to Shiloh to be near to God. It was effortless. You could just worship an idol right there. And so for hundreds of years, Israel's heart of worship is seared. It is seduced by the idols of the land. And pretty soon, by the time you get to Isaiah, the nation of Israel has fully embraced the idols of the land, and they've kept God 
like a little like a little genie, you could rub his tummy once a month just to get some good luck. They kept God over here just to keep their, their to hedge their bets. They, they, they didn't want to take any chances, so they kept God around. But they loved Baal, and they loved Asherah. And then the, the degeneracy that we're experiencing in a nation right, as a nation right now, the downward spiral of a nation that's turned its back on God goes just like Israel's history. Well, by the time you get to Isaiah, near the end of the period of the kings, they're, wash, they're worshiping Molech. They've graduated from Baal and Asherah, and they're worshiping Molech. And how do you worship Molech? You take your firstborn child. And when the fire of the fires to Molech had heated up the little bronze chute that came up to the top of the altar, you take your first born baby and roll them down that white hot bronze chute straight into the fire. And historians say you could hear the screams of the babies all through the streets of Jerusalem. And that was their worship when Isaiah comes on the scene. And God says to Israel, he says to Israel, uh, the land is full of idols and the people worship things they made with their own hands. I want to suggest to you this morning that though we don't have Baals and Asherah poles, and fortunately we don't have Molech, we have the spirit of Baal and the spirit of Asherah and the spirit of Molech alive and well in this nation. And the spirit of the age is, is focused on getting you to do one thing, but to be in awe of anything other than God. And if it's a possession, if it's your car, if it's your motorcycle, if it's any kind of a possession, your house, and the enemy gets you to be in awe of that house, or in awe of that car, or in awe of that jewelry, or in awe of whatever, fill in the blank, in awe of that relationship, in awe of that person in your life that you begin to treat like their God himself, in, in, in awe of your education, in, in, in anything, it doesn't matter. You see, when God gives us the second commandment, he said, you shall have no other gods before me. And that Hebrew word translated before doesn't mean, it does not mean you can have your idols, but just make sure God is first. That's what tripped up the Israelites in Isaiah's day. That word before, if you could put the, the scripture back up there, please, for a second. That word before means I don't want to see your gods in my presence, in my face, is a literal translation. Don't bring your gods in my face. In other words, the only God that we're to be in awe of is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The only God we're to be in awe of is our King that we just celebrated in the service this morning. The only God that we're to be in awe of is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The only God we're to be in awe of is the God who loved this world so much that he sent his only begotten son who hung on a cross. And while he was hanging on the cross, said of those who had put him there, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And when he breathed his last and said, it is finished, what he meant was God's plan of salvation that began all the way in Genesis chapter 3 when he said to, 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 to Eve that the seed of the woman would, would, would crush Satan's head and he would bruise her heel. All the way from there, God had been planning for your redemption. That God who created you in his image. That God who knows what makes you tick. That God who knows your destiny and your purpose is jealous of your worship because because he does not want the enemy to steal God's purpose in your life. So Westgate, God is, called, God is calling his people back to worship. He's calling you away from the idols of this world back to worship. Are you ready to say, God, I'll be a worshiper. 
I'll worship you by following you. I'll worship you by wetting your feet with my tears. I'll, I'll worship you by putting the net on the other side of the boat. I, I'll worship you however you want. Just come close to me, Lord. And my response to you, Lord, will be one of awe and worship. God is calling his people back to worship. This is why Isaiah wraps up this theme in chapter 51 by saying, those who've been ransomed by the Lord will return and they will enter Jerusalem singing, crowned with everlasting joy. Sorrow and mourning will disappear and they will be filled with joy and gladness. 